afternoon from Paris and Athens. My name is Stephanie Papazoglou and I am the Vice President of the uh, Hellenic Institute of Diplomacy, Cultural Diplomacy in Paris. Uh, today, today we have the honor to invite my beloved friend Achilles Tamantiadis uh, for an interview in his recent academic research with the title of uh, the heavily and terrestrial manifestation of an ancient goddess uh, from Epidocles Aphrodite. And Achilles um, Tamatiadis is a research. Um, and uh, we thank you, Achilles, for having him today, um, even though it's uh, a Saturday afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure is all, all, all mine. So my first question to you, Achilles, is um, which is the goddess that you mentioned in the uh, title of your lecture? Uh, why is she called heavily and terrestrial? So uh, I give you the floor, Achilles. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind and wonderful words, Stephanie, as always. Um, I'm just going to start by repeating the title um, to kind of... Uh, crystallize the concepts that we're about to, to discuss. So my title is Heavenly and Terrestrial Manifestations of an Ancient Goddess from Empedocles' Aphrodite until Ficino's commentary on the Platonic Symposium. And there are many questions, as you, uh, as you already pointed, that arise from such a title. Uh, first of all, as you said, what do we mean by heavenly and terrestrial? And to understand this concept, I think that uh, perhaps the most clear example that I can think of uh, is, is to be found in Plato's, uh, Plato's Symposium, uh, which is a very, very important ancient text. Uh, it's a platonic dialogue. And um, we know that the, the main idea and the main concept that is discussed in Plato's Symposium is, of course, the concept of eros or love. And we have um, a group of Athenian men um, that have gathered at the house of Agathon, who is the host, and each of the men uh, chooses to describe a different aspect of uh, the concept of eros. So when we come to the second speech of Pausanias, Pausanias of Athens, we hear for the first time uh, about a distinction that Pausanias makes between two types of Aphrodite. Um, there is Aphrodite Urania, which refers to uh, a heavenly form of Aphrodite, which is related to a non-bodily form of love, and which is related to the uh, mutual, let's say, contemplation of the idea of beauty via uh, uh, a mutual reflection on the idea of beauty by both the eromenos and the erastes. Um, and uh, then we have, uh, of course, uh, Aphrodite pan pandemos, which is a rather different form of Aphrodite uh, related primarily to carnal lusts of, uh, you know, and, and of course to, 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 to um, various forms of, of, of copulation and, um, and uh, intermingling. intermingling. Um, and of course that form um, is, is rather castigated as a form that may lead to uh, the ultimate demise of, of someone if one uh, only indulges in such a type of eros. So what does the proper type of eros involve for Plato? Um, I think that, you know, spermatically, we, 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 we have the idea in um, Pausanias, the idea of a non-bodily conception of love, but we have to get to the speech of Diotima and remember here that the, the, the symposium acts as a climax. It's, it's, a, it's a climactic speech. So you know, uh, we, we, we move from concepts to other concepts and we move um, in, in a way that is climactic. So by the time we reach the speech of Daratima, which comes towards the end of the dialogue, uh, we, we have essentially reached the climax. 
several scholars have actually argued that the speech of Deotima is the climax of the Platonic Symposium. And it is in that speech where we realize that the pure conception of love is not only related to a non-bodily conception of love, but it is also related to a conception of love whereby the lover learns to contemplate the idea of beauty. And how does the lover contemplate the idea of beauty? Well, of course, we naturally start from a beautiful body, which is the first thing we see and the first thing we visualize when we come in contact with uh, something that's beautiful. But we have to move further, or in other words, deeper, uh, and in order to discover the, the very idea of beauty. So we move from a beautiful body to the idea of a beautiful soul. And from the idea of the beautiful soul, we then move to the idea of beauty itself, after understanding what makes every soul beautiful. And after we understand what makes every soul beautiful, and we also understand what beauty is, we can then, uh, having conceptualized the idea of beauty, act in ways that are beautiful in politics, lawmaking, and philosophy is the end scope of this process. So I do find this concept very, very interesting. And I do think that it acts as a very uh, interesting and important thought model, I would say. Indeed, uh, it's very interesting, this combination of uh, beauty of soul and uh, physical appearance, uh, beauty of physical appearance. Um, now, my question to you is that, um, you mentioned the idea of model of thought starting from Pafsenius in Plato's uh, Symposium. Uh, was that model of thought um, earlier? If so, can you further elaborate on the model's uh, diachronic uh, development? Absolutely, that's a wonderful question. and Thank you very much for asking it. Um, so uh, to, to, to discuss the concepts diachronic development, I will attempt to, uh, to discuss a theory that I propose, which you know, is, is, can be, you know, I'm sure that there can be thousands of counter arguments, but this is my proposition nevertheless. I do believe that the concept of Aphrodite Urania that Plato describes in, uh, Plato's, in, 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 in his symposium is actually a much earlier concept. And I do see, um, uh, the concept in earlier sources, um, especially if one considers, for example, the, um, the fragments of Empedocles. And in the fragments of Empedocles, we find essentially a figure which is named Aphrodite. There is no other appellation in that figure. She's simply named Aphrodite. And we do see that Aphrodite is responsible in the fragments for the conception of philotis, philotis. And what does philotis mean in Empedocles? Philotis is this supernatural force that unites elements together. Now, as we remember in pre-Socratic philosophy, there were four cardinal elements, uh, out of which all of life was composed. Uh, those four elements were the air, fire, water, and the earth. Those four elements were separated in this primary form of the cosmos. And they were separated by a force called nekos. And nekos is, of course, related to strife. And it's a concept which is rather related to gods like um, Ares, for example. Uh, so they were separated. They were, they, they were, you know, kind of swirling in the swerve and, 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 and swirling in, 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 in the chaos. And, um, um, uh, of course, uh, nothing would have happened with those, um, with those early elements if it were not for Aphrodite, uh, the personification of, the, of Philotis, that essentially united those elements. So what, what, what Aphrodite does is that she unites um, those elements. And from the unification of those elements, 
uh, all of uh, human life uh, can begin to exist. Um, so that is a very important conception because uh, we also find a mention in uh, another early pre-Socratic source, the Derveni Papyrus, which some scholars attribute to Anaxagoras, the pre-Socratic philosopher, we do find there too another mention to Aphrodite. This time in the Derveni Papyrus, we are sure that the mention is, uh, that, 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 that the Papyrus mentions Aphrodite Urania, because we have read the, the manuscript. And there too, Aphrodite Urania, much like the Aphrodite of Empedocles, is responsible for the concept of Philotis because she also connects elements together in a way that uh, allows all organic matter to exist. So uh, that convinces sorry to, me. Sorry to interrupt you, but just yeah. a quick question. So there is a similarities between them, right? There is no- There are similarities between the, the two texts, exactly. The analysis is that there are some similarities and what's really the interest of these similarities, but what's your thoughts on this? Well, what's interesting to me is that we see two pre-Socratic authors, because uh, the Reni Papyrus has been dated and it dates back to the pre-Socratic period. We see two pre-Socratic authors mentioning Aphrodite in a similar way, as a force that connects uh, the primary elements together. And that convinces me that that was one of the functions or one of the primordial conception of one of the functions of Aphrodite uh, Urania. Um, so that's where I, I kind of trace the roots of the concept of Aphrodite Urania okay, in, okay. In, in those two texts primarily. Um, now, of course, the concept is developed by Plato, and there, of course, we do see other conceptions like, you know, the idea of uh, a non-bodily love uh, uh, and the idea of a pure, a pure form of love, which is associated, associated with Urania, um, where um, basically, you know, this, this form of love leads one's soul towards virtue and towards acts of virtue. Uh, and of course, in the case of Pandemos, we do see a form of love that may lead to um, uh, more desolate and, um, and let's say um, dangerous um, situations. Um, so, so Plato is of course, would of course be, um, you know, our, 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 our next stop in this journey, in this diachronic journey. And then from Plato, I would also trace the concept in um, other sources. And again, I just wish to mention that this is kind of my theory and uh, open to any scholar that would uh, wish to dispute me and to uh, kind of counter argue. Uh, uh, but, but I do trace the concept of uh, an Aphrodite that resembles Aphrodite Urania as Plato describes her in uh, Hellenistic texts, namely in uh, um, uh, a beautiful text by Hariton of Aphrodisias, uh, which is called Kaliroi, uh, where we do see statues of uh, Aphrodite that certainly resemble the uh, statues that um, um, even um, later authors like Pausanias describe as uh, statues of Aphrodite Urania. Um, there is a mention of a statue in uh, uh, Hariton that uh, reminds me of the description of Pausanias when he visits Olympia and he sees a statue of Aphrodite Urania. Um, and uh, where, of course, we also see the symbolism of the turtle because this Aphrodite Urania that Pisanias describes has uh, one foot kind of protruding uh, you know, in, a, in a forward looking way. And it's also stepping on top of a small turtle, um, uh, which, which is a very uh, interesting concept because the turtle is also associated by some, uh, some scholars uh, um, um, with uh, more heavenly, um, let's say, 
manifestations of, of Aphrodite. Um, and, and, and could you please, and, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Achilles, but could you please, because it's a very interesting point, could you please elaborate uh, these in different significations of uh, the turtle? Now no. we're getting into very, very intricate in details. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I would be allowed to, to mention all of those details. <laughs> um, okay. uh, but but, 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 but uh, let's just say that, that, that it is a... Um, it is a being that, that lives for many, many years. So it, okay. it, it's, it's very, very wise. And, and, um, and wisdom is an attribute of Aphrodite Urania. Uh, uh, so, uh, and of course I can, I can say many more things, but uh, I'm not sure that time would, would, would allow us. Uh, but sure. you know, to move on, um, um, there are also other conceptions that are interesting. Because we, uh, for example, see in the uh, in the case of later authors like Ovid that there too uh, Aphrodite appears uh, in the famous Judgment of Paris scene, where uh, we see that um, uh, Athena offers to Paris um, the king of Troy, the prince of Troy. Uh, she offers as a gift to uh, kind of make him one of the greatest warlords of his time. Um, Ira, um, the mother of all gods, offers to, uh, or all, all Olympian gods, because you know you don't want to go further back because there you have other, um, other parents uh, like Rhea and Kronos. But you know, uh, and Ira offers um, to Paris um, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of, of, of Asia, and of course, we know that, that, that Aphrodite offers him Helen. There, I do see uh, a conception of Aphrodite that is related to Eros in the form of lust uh, and passion um, and consummation, because as we remember, Helen was the legal wife of Menelaus, who was the king of Sparta. Uh, so uh, it is out of lust that Paris steals her from Sparta and the Trojan War begins. Um, now there are scholars who will argue otherwise, who will argue that this was just a, a, you know, a, a surface cause and there was, there was another cause that started the war. But, you know, uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of discussion has, has occurred about uh, about you know how Paris was was um, you know, really en en enthralled by the appearance of Helen and he instantly fell in love with her and I think there's also a beautiful opera that one can explore if uh, one is interested to find out more about this which is um, Gluck's Paride et Elena which is a wonderful opera and uh, there you also have a beautiful aria which is on Venus where Paris in the opera, in the libretto of the opera, um, um, uh, uh, Paris uh, uh, prays to Venus um, to kind of consummate his uh, love with, uh, with, uh, with Helen. It's um, nice because you, you see it in, um, in a romantic way. Uh, there are lots of other reasons of that that war began or uh, yeah. started, but it's a nice way to see it from uh, a romantic only perspective and the love of these two uh, heroes, let's say, of course. Like, put it like that. So I enjoy that. <laughs> of course. Um, so, you know, we can also see it in Roman sources. <laughs> and you're right, I mean, it, it certainly is a more romantic uh, view of things. Um, and uh, uh, then we can, of course, trace the concept in Byzantine literature, uh, the concept of the two Venuses, uh, for example, in Zedzis, where we again see a version of Aphrodite that unites the elements together. Um, and uh, um, to my mind, this conception goes back to Empedocles, as I uh, discussed earlier. And of course, uh, you know, we, we then move from Byzantium to, to, to the West. And um, exhibit A, when we think of the Western reception of Aphrodite, 
is, to my mind, uh, Ficino, Marsilio Ficino, uh, probably one of the greatest humanists, um, a Florentine himself, um, a student of Clitho, who was one of the greatest Platonists of his time, and uh, Ficino was responsible for introducing Plato and the works of Plato to uh, Western audiences. Uh, we remember that after Constantinople, um, 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 Florence became the next big center, let's say, of knowledge and of the transmission of classical antiquity. And, um, and, and we, we do see that several uh, scholars and several uh, literati um, leave the area of Byzantium and move to Italy, various places, uh, and their, their their contributions are really seminal, you know, at that time. And I'm, I'm thinking here of uh, Hrisol Oras, of Marcos Musuros, and and, 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 and and so many others, and, and even Cardinal Pisarion, who, as we know, uh, had one of the most important libraries of 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 his time and and the, and and he moved a big chunk of that library to uh to venice to form the uh, the basis of the um the biblioteca marziana which until today is one of the one of the greatest libraries for, for the study of, of ancient manuscripts and ancient texts so um uh, I, I i just i can just remind you that it is there where we find Venetus A, uh, which um, and Venetus B, which are pro probably the two earliest manuscripts that we have for, 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 from the, the uh, related to the America America manuscript. Now, um, to, 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 to move on, um, I want to mention that you know within the larger scope of uh, Ficino's project, which to my mind uh, was related to um, an attempt to introduce Plato to this Western audience of Florence, um, and of course we're talking about the literati of Florence, but also you know, a, a big chunk of the populace, um, um, uh, and of course the elites. Um, what what uh, what what Ficino attempts is is essentially to to um, not only translate but also comment on the Platonic text. So what does he do? He invites a group of noblemen uh, at the Villa Careggi, uh, the, the, uh, which was a, a villa that belonged to the Medici family. We know that Ficino worked for both uh, Cosimo Medici and Lorenzo Medici, and he invites some of the brightest literati of his time at that villa for a discussion of the Platonic text, where uh, what, what, what this group of academicians and humanists do is that they first start by reading the Platonic Symposium, and then kind of uh, separating um, and, uh, and 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 uh, 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 choosing which part of the symposium each of the attendants is going to discuss, and um, we do have great scholars uh, at that event, like Cavalcanti, like the two Marustini brothers, Agli, who is a Catholic bishop and who eventually uh, decides to um, take the lead. Uh, in the discussion when it comes, uh, when, when the point comes for them to discuss Persianus' uh, speech. And of course, Agli is, is both inspired by uh, Plotinus, which is a very important source for, for Neoplatonists like Ficino and for um, academicians in his circle like, like Agli. He's inspired by Plotinus, but he's also inspired by early Christian uh, sources like Aquinas and even uh, Augustine. And the way Agli understands the, the, the conceptions of um, the heavenly and the terrestrial Aphrodite is that he essentially visualizes uh, the heavenly Aphrodite as a, a conception that is related to the angelic mind, which in Plotinus's 
cosmos is uh, is placed at the higher level, closer to the nos, to the nous, um, which is the most divine, let's say, element. And he places um, he places Aphrodite Pandemos closer to the world soul, which is only one level one level above um, uh, above matter, which for uh, Neoplatonists and especially for Gnostic uh, philosophers, I would rather add, um, is 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 rather associated with with, with evil, with the realm of evil. Now. Um, that is a very Neoplatonic reading of the two Venuses. What really matters in uh, this conception, in, in this uh, conceptualization rather of the of the two Venuses, um, is, I would say, Ficino's own interpretation of the two Venuses, and we do see that um, both in the uh, commentary in the Platonic Symposium. Um, at the particular excerpts uh, where uh, Ficino uh, describes uh, um, the concepts of the Platonic Symposium um, but uh, during his, his speech. But also uh, we see that in a letter that Ficino writes to Antonio Manetti and to Bernardo del Nero, who are two important humanists, uh, of this time, uh, Del Nero is one of uh, is a very important statesman, and Manetti is a very important architect in Florence. And they're both humanists, and they're both leaders in their fields, and they're both literati. And it is there where Ficino mentions for the first time that I do see that a lot of leaders in my time have been led astray, and they've been led astray in matters of love. And I wish to revive a conception that goes back to the Platonic Symposium in order to um, inform them about uh, a way to love which may lead them to a better form of leadership, a more virtuous form of leadership. And I think that leads me, leads me to my kind of third subsection and kind of my concluding um, thought on this, which is, which yeah. is and of course, we can have a discussion about this after 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 we, we we finish discussing about those concepts. But which is which is you know what is the relevance of the Platonic text, you know, in a kind of more early modern discussion of those conceptions, and what can the relevance be for for someone who, let's say, is concerned with the, the subject matter of leadership. And there again, we come back to the concept of Diotima. And uh, interestingly, that was exactly the thought that Ficino had, because in the same letter that he writes to uh, Del Nero and Manetti, he mentions Diotima. And he says that my response to this, uh, to, to, to this observation, uh, you know, to the fact that I see that people have been led astray in matters of love, my response and my cure will be them uh, to, to reintroduce to my fellow humanists and to fellow leaders in Florence at my time, the concept of the love that Diotima describes through the mouth of Socrates in the symposium. As we, as we mentioned, that concept is related to the contemplation of beauty starting from the beautiful body, moving to the beautiful soul, um, from there on moving to the uh, conceptualization of uh, what the idea of beauty in all uh, souls uh, and kind of to an, understanding of, or to an understanding of what makes every soul beautiful. And after having understood that, uh, we then move on to uh, the very idea of beauty which in Plato is related to uh, the concept of agathon, uh, which is related to uh, both uh, the dikaion, the just, and the, uh, and the virtues, the anadaton. So this is kind of the pinnacle of, of all philosophy in a way. And once we've understood that, then we can become better leaders because we can apply all of those concepts 
um, to leadership models, and we can become better leaders in the realm of, of philosophy, of lawmaking, and of politics. So I think that that's, that's an important takeoff, if we may put it this way, of, uh, of let's say, the, the thought process of, of Ficino, which uh, goes back to Plato and the symposium. True. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but just I wanted to comment on all these interesting uh, analyses um, that you just mentioned. But um, what I see is that the beauty in itself, it's a definition that, of course, based on objective criteria, uh, but there is also some variations and there are also some implications of subject subjective uh, criteria. So the definition of beauty is really very hard at the end of the day to define it because uh, there is not really a straightforward answer to what is really beauty with a combination of course of uh, physical appearance and also the soul of each person and each personality that change every um it depends on the uh, period of time it depends on everything i mean uh, there are lots of factors to define that beauty so it's really very absolutely. interesting absolutely you're, you're absolutely right about that and what you just said reminded me of um, of a concept again from pre-socratic philosophy when um democritus describes uh, or rather discusses the concept of truth and we we do we do find in democritus an experiment whereby he invites four people. Uh, and I'm, I'm just giving a random number here, but he invites four people and he allows them to taste um, a liquid, which is inside a small jar, let's say. And three out of the four people say that the liquid is sweet. And only one of them says that, no, the liquid is bitter. Now, from let's say a sample of 1,000 people, those four people that said that the liquid is sweet might be wrong because they might not be able to taste. They might, they might be, let's say, um, uh, survivors of COVID-19 and they might not be able to, to taste uh, the, uh, the liquid. Uh, and the one person who says that the liquid is bitter might be saying the truth. But uh, to my mind, uh, and of course, you know, uh, uh, this was a tragic mention to the tragic event of COVID-19 that has saddened me very much. But I did notice that one of the symptoms that I had, that I also had when I, when I, when I got the disease was, was that I, I could hardly smell, I could hardly, I can understand uh, you know, uh, the senses of my smell. So uh, that, was, that was one of uh, the personal experiences that I have had and that I'm sharing with, with, uh, with the participants of this, of this event. So it, it's possible that, you know, the four people are saying, are saying lies and the one person is saying the truth, that this liquid is bitter. What is truth uh, is the next question. And of course, the answer that you know, Democritus gives, and he doesn't give that directly, but you know, the philosopher can think around the concepts that Democritus discusses. Um, the answer that we get is that truth is essentially the concept of eterotis. And eterotis can, I think, be translate, translated as uniqueness. It is the uniqueness of the personal experience that each of the participants of the experiment describes and shares. And that is why immortal works of art, now think of the symphonies of Beethoven, or think of, let's say, the, um, the operas of Mozart, or think of, let's say, the, um, the wonderful works of Monteverdi, or think of you know, the beautiful poetry of Ascanio Almateo, or even Constantine Cavafy. All of those poets, all of those creators, what really distinguished and what really made their art you know, unique and memorable and even immortal was the fact that this art exhibited a sense of uniqueness. And it's perhaps only in this way that we can experience um, the idea or a, a conceptualization of the idea of, of truth. 
through an experience of uh, the Husia, the concept of Husia. And the concept of Husia in ancient Greek is related to the word being because uh, Husia comes from, uh, let's say, the uh, female type of the participle of the verb hey me or e me, which means both I am and yeah. I exist. So, and of course, we know that the, the word for participle in Greek is metohi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, meto, metohe means think... participation. Yeah. And it is essentially, mm -hmm. just to close this parenthesis, it sure, is so. essentially by participating in the uniqueness of being, of the usia, that we get to know more about the truth of things. So I find that a very, very interesting conception. And it reminded me of what you said about, you know, kind of the different conceptions of beauty that, you know. No, I really like the parallel, of course, but I really wanted to know more about all these. But the thing is that we're running <laughs> okay. out of time. So my last... So we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to uh, arrange we'll another arrange session. Arrange another one, yes, with, with pleasure, <laughs> because we have so many information, so many things to rest. say. So maybe we should uh, arrange uh, a further se session on that. So uh, my last question to you is, where does this model of thought lead us at the end? And if you have any interesting conclusions uh, related to early modern discussions of the Platonic concept of the two Venices. That's a beautiful question. And uh, if I may add, uh, I wish to thank you for the whole interview because it was a lovely interview overall and I really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> so well. to answer the question, mm. um, to answer the question, I, I would say that, that uh, the thought process that Plato uh, so keenly describes in the symposium is quite important in the sense that it may lead us by further contemplating on it to better models of leadership. That's where I kind of end my own, let's say, visualization and mental conception of, uh, conceptualization of the platonic idea, because it is by understanding the idea of beauty, as Plato describes it in the in the symposium, but also in the Phaedrus, which is another beautiful dialogue that we didn't have the, the time to, uh, to, to, to further analyze today. Um, it is by understanding the concept of beauty as a concept which is associated, associated with justice, with uh, virtue, and with beauty, that we can understand uh, ways in which to act as leaders that uh, can really make a difference in this world. So uh, that's Great. all for today, I guess. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. I guess so you have to cut me short at some point. I think so it's we're... Zoom. It's not me. I really wanted to hear more, but I think the Zoom limit is, uh, limited us to 40 minutes. So unfortunately, uh, we will have to end that very interesting analysis and uh, interview with you, my friend, Achilleas. Thank you for accepting. Thank you for your time, especially a Saturday uh, afternoon. Um, I hope that the audience really enjoyed as I enjoyed myself uh, this lovely interview and uh, hope to arrange another one uh, soon with you on Thank another you. topic or even to go deeper into this analysis and uh, I don't know if you wish to say something before we close the interview. I just wish to thank you very much for this wonderful discussion and the opportunity um, to discuss about this interesting in my view topic. I hope that the, the audience is not extremely bored. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. But, no, 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 of but, course uh, not. Yeah. Of course not. And maybe we can receive some comments uh, after the video um, and you can even uh, reply, respond to that. Uh, certainly some uh, reactions. Um, so have an excellent evening, certain evening. Thank you. Uh, bon soiree, as we bon say soirée. in Paris. <laughs> bon soiree. Eh, que lo bravo. <laughs> que calo bravi, eh, as we say it in Greek. So thank you so much, Achilleo. Thank you. Bye.